to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ concerning the old testament scriptures the bible says the things that were written before time were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might find hope romans chapter 15 verse number four we welcome you today to our study of the value of the Old Testament. Now there is an Old Testament and there is a New Testament in the Bible and Christians are living today under the new law of Christ. But that doesn't mean there isn't great value to the old law. And so today we're going to talk about what that value is. We encourage you to locate your Bible and have that ready as we're going to look to the scriptures together. We are bringing these lessons to you by members of the Lord's Church, the Churches of Christ in your area. Would love for you to visit their assemblies. Uh, if you've got a, a Bible question, you'd like to have a Bible study with them, they'd be more than happy to sit down and search the Scriptures with you. And please visit one of their assemblies on Sunday or Wednesday. You'll find people there who love God and are concerned about lost souls. And friend, we'd like to also invite you to visit our website here at The Gospel of Christ. The address is thegospelofchrist.com. All of our material is free and available for download. Uh, you can view our media from there. Our CDs and DVDs are online. Or if you'd like to have a car hard copy of that, you can call us or email us and write us, and we'd be glad to get that to you. Let's now turn our attention to the value of the Old Testament. Sometimes Christians, uh, it is said of Christians that they don't really believe in the Old Testament. And friend, while we realize the Old Testament is not our law and judge, nothing could be further from the truth. We believe the Old Testament is from God. We believe that it has great value for the child of God and within its boundaries and according to its purposes, the old law is something the Christian can find so beneficial and useful in his life. Now, let's think about first and foremost, what is the, the major purpose of the Old Testament? What is the old law trying to get us to. Well, according to Galatians 3 verse 24, the main point, the end result of the Old Testament scriptures was to bring us to Christ and Christianity. Listen to what the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3 verse number 24 about that end result of the Old Testament. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. It, when you think about the old law and its design, its purpose, its intent, it was to bring people to Jesus. It was to bring Christ, God's plan, the scheme of redemption, all the promises, prophecies, all of the Old Testament is pointing us to Jesus Christ. I once had a Bible class teacher who made this statement, and it's always stuck with me. He said, guys, if you miss Christ in the Old Testament, you've missed the whole point of it. Well, friend, that's exactly right. Jesus is the end result and product of the prophecies and promises of the Messiah in the Old Testament. Now, let's also realize that uh, the Old Testament has some major boundaries that it sets within its own law. The old law was never designed to last forever. That's not its purpose. That's not its intent. It was not a permanent law 
for all ages. Now, to help us understand that, we need to see this from the Old Testament itself. If I were going to show someone, hey, we're not living under the old law today. It's not the law that God wants us to follow. I'd want to show them from the old law itself. And so I invite you to look in your Bible in Jeremiah chapter 31. And I want you to see this promise that is made under the Old Testament about its temporary nature. Listen to Jeremiah 31, beginning in verse number 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more. The, the Old Testament right here in the midst of the major prophet Jeremiah tells us the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Now, by inspiration, the writer of the book of Hebrews builds upon this very strong point and says, in Hebrews 8, 12, and 13, in that God says a new covenant. He's made the first obsolete. What is growing old and becoming obsolete is ready to vanish away. The Holy Spirit teaches us, based on Jeremiah 31, 31, that this law was never designed to last forever. And so it was given to a specific people, the Jews, Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 2 following, with a specific end date in mind when Christ comes into the world. And so as you think about the Old Testament, let's realize some things that, that God never intended the Old Testament do, to do for us today. First and foremost, the old law is not our law and our judge today. I am not, when I decide, uh, when, when God tells us you know, how to worship, when God tells me how to live, I'm not going to look in the old law to find out that for today, nor when I stand before God on the judgment day, am I going to be judged by the old law. How do we know that? Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse number 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. Well, what is it? The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Not the words of Moses, not the words of the prophets, not the words found in 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Although we're going to notice great lessons we can learn there. I'm living under, and so are you, the New Testament law of Christ. Colossians 2 verse 14 says, The law of commandments contained in ordinances, it was nailed to the cross. And I'm not living by that law anymore. And so, just like a citizen in the United States of America is not amenable to the laws of Canada, friend, I'm not amenable to the laws of the Old Testament. They're not for me. They're not during that age. I'm going to be under, and I am under, the new law of Christ today. Friend, let's also realize that the Old Testament, it's not God's plan for making peace between all nations, including Jews and Gentiles today. I want you to listen to the words of Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 14. As you think about this idea, God's plan for bringing uh, both Jews and Gentiles into His one covenant, it's found in Jesus Christ today, not found under the old law and the old covenant of Moses. Listen to Ephesians 2, verse 14 and 15. The Bible says of Jesus, For He Himself is our peace, who's made both one, that's Jew and Gentile, who's made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in His flesh the enmity, that is, 
the law of commandments, containments, ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. How is God bringing Jew and Gentile together in one body today? Not by the law of commandments, containing ordinances, no. That was nailed to the cross. But through the glorious gospel and new covenant of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, friend, let's also realize, as we think about the Old Testament, the Old Testament is not where we look today to learn how to become a Christian. If I want to know what must I do to be saved, Acts 16, verse 30 and 31, I don't look to the Old Testament. I'm not going to turn to Genesis or Exodus or, or Numbers or any of those prophets or major or minor prophets. The New Testament is where we learn how to be saved today. Acts 4 verses 11 and 12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only name. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Him. If Jesus is the only one with that power, if He's the one who brings people to the Father today, and friend, I want to look to the new covenant of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to know how to be saved. And friend, let's realize this point as well. The Old Testament is not where we look to find out how God wants the church, His people today, to worship Him. Colossians 3.17 says this, And whatever you do, talking to Christians, and whatever you do, in word or or indeed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. To do something in Jesus' name means to do it with His approval and by His authority. And so Christians are commanded to do what we do by the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thinking about some of the ways that both the Jews and the Gentiles, uh, Gentile converts, proselytes, or those living under the patriarchal law, worship God. A woman came to Jesus with a question. She said, Lord, uh, the Jews say we need to worship in Jerusalem. And our people say we need to worship over here on Mount Gerizim. Where is the right place to worship? That's what she wants to know of Jesus. Here's what Jesus said. It's, not, it's no longer the place, but he said this. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. We're worshiping according to the New Testament teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friend, I'm not worshiping like they did under the Old Testament. I'm not going to the temple. I'm not making sacrifice. I'm not burning incense. I'm not offering a turtle dove or a lamb or whatever all that may be. A lot of things are detailed under the Old Testament. That's not how we worship today. We look to the New Testament, law of Jesus Christ on worship. Now, that makes then several things very pertinent. Whatever they did under the Old Testament, that's not my pattern. And that's not your pattern for worship today. I'm not going to Jerusalem. I'm not doing things like that. I'm not worshiping in the Old Testament temple because that's not for us. Now, friend, if that's true, then let's not appeal to the Old Testament about principles of worship today. When God teaches us to preach the gospel, when God teaches us to take the Lord's Supper, when God teaches us to sing, I'm not then going to go back to the Old Testament to find out how to do any of those. I want to see what did New Testament Christians do. How did the church worship in the first century and what's pleasing to God today? And then, of course, I want to look to the Bible, God's Word for everything we do under Christ's authority and with His approval. And so we say, of course, these are things we don't look to the Old Testament to. Where then is the value of it? Well, let me mention several things today where the Old Testament and a study of the Old Testament is extremely valuable for the child of God. Friend, the Old Testament answers some of life's most fundamental and important questions. Questions about our origin, our purpose, and our destiny are clearly found in the Old Testament. For example, 
If we were to ask the question, who am I? Where did I come from? How did I get here? Friend, the Old Testament clearly has the answers to those questions. Who am I? I am a special creation made by Almighty God, created by His hand, by, uh, with His power. I'm not a product of, of evolution or some man's thinking. Listen to Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26. You want to know who you are? Here's who we are. The Bible said, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the earth, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over all cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. I, I am the special product and creation of God. I'm the pinnacle of all that God made. And friend, I have been endowed with the spirit and a soul given by God. Listen to Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7. The Bible records these words. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being or a living soul. God created me out of the dust of the ground. One day I realize I'm going to return to that. But friend, I have a living soul that is one day going to spend eternity somewhere. And so when we ask the question, who am I? Let's realize we're created by God. How wonderful and how special that is. You know, one of the great questions we also can answer under the Old Testament is, why am I here? I know who created me. I know where I am. I'm upon God's creation that He made, according to Genesis chapter 1. But why am I here? Why did God choose to create me? Friend, God made me because He wanted His children, His people, to love Him, to follow Him, and to live with Him for all eternity. And this is my opportunity to do just that. Solomon thought about the meaning of life under the Old Testament. He tried everything under the sun uh, to find joy and happiness and meaning, but none of the things he looked at really brought a true lasting meaning to him until the end of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. He says, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's it all about? Why am I here? Fear God. Keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Why? For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. I'm here to love God, to obey Him, to serve Him, and to prepare to live with Him for all eternity. You see, God created us to magnify and honor His name with our life. Isaiah 43, verse 7, God says, Everyone who's called by my name, whom I created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Friend, you have a special, unique purpose given by Almighty God. That is to honor, to glorify, to be a light into the world for God, and to live in your life in such a way that you're prepared to spend eternity with God forever. But you know, the Bible also answers some other great questions that are found in the Scripture, and, and the Old Testament helps us with those. How long are we going to be here? You know, that's a question a lot of people are asking. And of course, we find on the New Testament, life's very brief, but in greater detail. We're told in Psalm 90, verses 10 through 12, 70, if we're lucky, maybe 80 years upon this earth. My life and yours is going to be rather brief in view of everything. And so this is my brief opportunity to serve God and to, to live with Him. But you know, as you think about great questions that the Old Testament helps us to answer, it also points us toward eternity. Where do I go after this brief life is over? Job asked the question in Job 14, verse 14, If a man dies, will he live again? And of course we learn 
under the Old Testament about that place called heaven, that place uh, of torment, that life does not end here on this earth. And Jesus answers that even better. In John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, all are in the graves will one day come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And so, yes, there is a place after this life. Heaven for those who follow God, hell for those who choose not to. And friend, what a wonderful privilege I have to prepare to live with God for all eternity. But you know, when you think about the Old Testament, another really valuable purpose is the Old Testament helps detail man's relationship with God. From the very beginning, even up to the, the, the time of the New Testament, God's relationship with man is detailed greatly. For example, we learn in the Bible, even back in the Old Testament, that God created man as a, with His own will, as a free moral agent, and God gave him every opportunity to serve Him. God created man out of the dust of the ground. He placed Adam and Eve in that beautiful garden in Genesis chapter 3. They weren't robots or drones just doing whatever God said. There was great blessings and benefits from following God, but they had a free will, and they chose the wrong thing. And as a result, they entered into sin. God made one simple law for Adam and Eve. Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you will surely die, God said. And so under the Old Testament Scripture, we learn about God and God's plan for man and how God wanted him to live for all eternity. But we also learn that man was tempted by Satan and that he gave in to sin. Genesis 3, there's that fruit that God told them not to eat. And the serpent beguiles or, or tricks Adam and Eve. They begin to listen to the wrong voice. And as a result, they eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they're separated from God for eternity. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. And friends, since that moment in time, in the Old Testament, where God's relationship with man was severed, God has been planning, working overtime to restore that relationship. God wants us to be back with Him and to live with Him for all eternity. And that's the, that's the relationship that is so beautifully detailed throughout Scripture, how God is working for that purpose. But you know, as you think about the Old Testament, the Old Testament also helps us define and really understand sin and forgiveness. The law, the Bible says the old law showed what sin was. Romans 7 verse 13, Romans 3 verse 20, it was a violation of God's commands. And it was that law, the Bible says, that kept sin in check. The purpose of the law was to point out sin, to set the boundaries, and to let man know when he violated God's law and to keep sin in check. And friend, the old law showed us very clearly the consequences of that sin given by God. And that is spiritual death. What happened in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve ate of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Sin came into the world. Death came into the world. Hard times and separation and difficulty came. But that law that clearly told what sin was could not provide a remedy for it. Hebrews 10 verse 4, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. But that old law did promise forgiveness. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I make a new covenant with the house of Israel, Jeremiah 31, verse 31, and then verse 34, the Bible says, I'll be merciful to their sins, their lawless deeds I'll remember no more. Based on Christ, there's the whole point of the old law. Based on Christ, sins could be forgiven. But we see Jesus, Hebrews 2, verse 9, this man, after he's offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. But then let me mention this powerful purpose of the Old Testament. One of the great lessons that as I study the Old Testament, as I read the messages therein, one of the great things you can learn and values of it is the Old Testament 
gives us real life examples we can relate to. Think about people that you relate to under the Old Testament. Do you ever face any suffering? you ever face any difficulty in life? you ever face sickness and disease and, and things like under that? There's a man in the Old Testament who's helped lots of people with that, and his name is Job. Job was blameless, upright, a man who feared God and shunned evil. And yet bad things happened to Job. He lost his wealth, he lost his family, he lost his health. But we remember from Job that Job stayed faithful to God and was blessed more in the end than in the beginning. We learn lessons maybe from, from David about his sin with Bathsheba, from Nadab and Abihu about their not following the, the word and the will of God in worship, about Cain and Abel and how Cain murdered his brother Abel. And the list goes on and on. The Old Testament shows us real examples that we can look to and follow and that I can say, hey, when this happens, I remember that man in the Old Testament, that woman in the Old Testament who faced this, here's a lesson I can learn from that. But friend, as we mentioned, the main point of that beautiful set of scriptures known as the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. We're promised victory in Christ, Genesis 3 verse 15. We're promised that all God's blessings are going to come to the seed of Abraham who is ultimately Christ. Genesis 22 verse 18, forgiveness, an eternal kingdom, the, 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 the totality of God's promises are embodied in Jesus Christ. He is the fulfillment of the law. Friend, we encourage you today as you think about this idea, are you a child of God? Have you obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? If not, why not do that today? Do you believe Jesus is God's Son? Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. Would you be willing to repent? Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish, the Lord said in Luke 13, 3. Would you confess the name of Jesus before men? Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And would you do what Jesus said? Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. If you've never been baptized into Christ, why not do that? And friend, as we study the scripture, let's live our lives in such a way that it brings God glory and honor that one day we can hear those wonderful words, well done, good and faithful servant. May God help us live in such a way that our lives will bring honor to Him. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.